What does your body feel like in zero gravity? What inspires you to become an astronaut? What exercise do you do? And do you sweat in space? What do yo-yo work in microgravity? So it works. Station, this is Houston. Are you ready for the event? Houston, this is Station. I am ready for the event. McGovern Medical School, this is Mission Control Houston. Please call Station for a voice check. Station, this is McGovern Medical School. How do you hear us? McGovern Medical School, I have you loud and clear. So it, it, it's delightful, Serena, to see you again. Um, we hope you're enjoying your time on the space station. We're incredibly proud of you and proud to have you as a distinguished alum of this wonderful medical school. So congratulations to you and Drew on the successful capture of the Japanese HTV cargo vehicle just a few minutes ago. Uh, thanks for speaking with us. Today reminds us all, but especially for our women students, that the sky's the limit at McGovern Medical School. So we expect a lively Q&A with you and are anxious to learn from you. Thanks again. Thanks, Dean Stoll. I am totally excited to be here and so excited to talk with you all today. Hi, Dr. Anya and Chancellor. My name is Kelsey Montgomery and I'm a third year student. And my question is, can you talk about the importance of medicine in space and then how it relates to medicine on Earth? Yeah, Kelsey, I think that's, an, it's, that's a great question. You know, certainly people think about the medical changes that occur to the body when you're in space, and, and those are many, and stuff, it, they're things that we look at as we push on further towards the moon and Mars. Um, for example, your bones and your muscles are immediately unloaded. Um, there are changes that occur in your brain, even in your eyes. We start to see some swelling of the optic disc, in fact, some changes in the retina even. But more importantly, a lot of folks on the ground want to know that, you know, why is the medicine you're doing in space important for medicine on Earth? Why should I care about that? And I think people should care because a lot of the experiments we're doing up here could directly impact them on Earth. And I'll, I'll give you just a couple examples. Uh, one example I did just about a month ago was uh, research looking at endothelial cells. And it turns out that endothelial cells up here in orbit really like to grow. So on Earth, they're not as easy to culture. They don't last for a very long period of time. But up here, endothelial cells feel like they're at home. And so we actually did some studies we were where we were testing chemotherapeutic agents on those endothelial cells with the hopes of perhaps attacking a tumor's vascular supply one day. Uh, another good example is looking at the protein amyloid. Amyloid, as you know, is a protein that's been implicated in Alzheimer's disease and in other chronic disease processes. And again, up here in microgravity, the amyloid protein grows in 3D, in a sense. And so by growing in that 3D way, it gives scientists and researchers uh, a better ability to view that protein, look at its shape, and perhaps uh, create new targets for novel therapies. That's just a couple of the examples. I could go on and on about this all day long, but I do want folks to walk away with one message, and that's a lot of the science we are doing up here definitely helps to better the lives of folks down on Earth. Hi, Dr. Anya and Chancellor. My name is Ali Norbesh. I'm a first year medical student here at McGovern. Uh, my question for you today is uh, how exactly did you decide that you wanted to be an astronaut? Uh, where exactly were you in your career, your education, and, and what sparked your interest? So I, I got to be honest, I wanted to be an astronaut since I was little, little, probably about eight years old. Uh, I remember watching shuttle missions when I was a child and, you know, my parents, my sisters, everybody had always encouraged me. I wasn't quite sure what path that would take. And as I entered medical school at McGovern, I began thinking about what residency I wanted to go into and, and what I was going to do. And I wasn't sure. But during your fourth year, you get the chance to do some away electives and some rotations. And I discovered a rotation at Johnson Space Center in Houston, Texas for aerospace 
medicine. And so I was able to take advantage of that. I really wasn't quite sure what I was walking into at the time, but that month was absolutely amazing. I learned about the changes that occur in the physiology of the human body, not only in differing environments like high altitude environments or hyperbaric environments, but also, of course, in space. And that's what helped lead me to go into the residency that I chose, which was a combination of internal medicine and aerospace medicine. So I just kind of waited for those doors to open, and they continued to open during my career to kind of point me the way. Thank you. Hello, Dr. Onion Chancellor. My name is Emily Burgess. I'm a second year medical student, and I was wondering if you could describe the process of becoming an astronaut. Yeah, so it's, uh, I think some people think you become an astronaut and then maybe you fly just a couple years later and it's a long process and a lot of my colleagues can, would agree with me, but once you get chosen as an astronaut, you're officially known as an astronaut candidate at first and you go through about a two to three year period of initial training and because we're in the era of space station, we had training on space station systems, on how to operate the robot arm and again, we use that today to capture the HTV-7 vehicle. Uh, we learn how to do spacewalks. We train for spacewalks in the big neutral buoyancy laboratory, which is our big pool. Uh, and we even take Russian language lessons. And so a lot of our time um, consists of that the first couple of years to sort of uh, create that framework and that base for how to operate on station. And then you wait your turn. You wait your turn for a flight, and one of those lucky days you get called into the chief's office and they say, we've got a flight for you, and you rejoice, and then it's another two years or so of training to get ready for that mission specifically. And during that time, um, you're honing your skills, again, robot arms, spacewalks, ISS systems, uh, but also about some of the specific science that's gonna be going up during your mission. And a lot of times you don't even learn about some of that science until you're up here. Um, it's a long process. It's, it's very much worthwhile, uh, requires a lot of travel. You are overseas a lot uh, during the training period. Hi, Dr. Anian, Chancellor. My name is Meyer, and I was wondering what it was like going into space for the first time. You know, you, you try and gather as much information as you can from your fellow astronauts and say, well, what's launch like? Well, how did you feel? Well, how did you feel? And Everybody's different. Um, I can say that certainly during launch, it was amazing. We knew that when that rocket lit, we were going somewhere real fast. And, uh, but the ride was really smooth. The part, <laughs> the part that was really jolting were the stage cutoffs where you almost felt like you were thrown in your seat. And then one kind of interesting medical thing that occurs right at uh, main engine, just kind of the main cutoff of the rocket when you are in orbit, uh, and I had heard this from other astronauts that they feel the moment that those, the moment those engines cut off, they feel like they're hanging from the ceiling, almost like Spider-Man. And I thought, well, that's odd. And sure enough, when those engines finally cut off, I felt like my world tilted by 45 degrees. So my brain was trying to process where I was and that there were no more gravitational cues. I felt like the control panel was further away. I just felt like everything shifted. It was very odd. It wasn't scary at all. It was just odd. And that lasted about three to four hours and then slowly went away. Hi, Serena. My name is Kale. Uh, my question is, uh, if seeing Earth from space uh, gave you a new appreciation for how special our world is, and with that in mind, do you think we will ever find life on another world? So I'll give you a very specific example for t from today. Uh, Drew, our commander up here, he and I were in our cupola, which is kind of like our window to the Earth, where we can look out, and we were watching as HTV-7 approached. And I've seen HTV a lot of times, but always from the ground and always on a TV monitor. To see it for real coming towards the space station, to know that a, a cargo vehicle made in a different country is approaching the International Space Station and we're gonna capture it with an arm and then berth it was amazing. To just know that that vehicle, we, that our society, our world, our planet, has advanced that far technologically to where some people think that's an everyday occurrence up here, that we just bring cargo vehicles in all the time. And it's never normal. It's, it's always a very calculated um, and very complicated technologically. But to watch that vehicle come in and know that we had a plan and that there were critical supplies on board and that those supplies were sent for us and for the science on station, 
That to me was absolutely amazing. Don't get me wrong, I love looking at Earth, but I love looking at what we're able to do in low Earth orbit. Hi, Serena. My name is Sally, one of the psychiatrists in here. Uh, my question is, is there any special thing astronauts do to keep their mental well-being in space? Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, you find out, uh, it's what I term what's important to you and what's not important to you up here. Honestly, one of our biggest behavioral, um, I'd say, uh, assets that we have up here is our exercise equipment, which I plan on talking about a little later. When, when, those, when those pieces of equipment go down, we try and fix them as fast as we can because that's important to us. We watch the news, the, the, the nightly news, every evening. Now, we kind of get it a day later than everybody else, but we like to keep in touch with what's going on down there on Earth. We like to keep in touch with our families, so we have weekly video conferences with our families. Uh, we have a voice over internet phone, so I can call pretty much any cell phone on the planet at any time. It's small things like that. HTV arriving, we've got, we know and we are working hard to open that hatch tonight because we've got goodies waiting in there for us. Foods that we haven't had maybe in a few months and that we're really looking forward to it. So those are just some small things, but what we found is that when you eliminate even the small things, they make a huge impact psychologically. Thank you. Hello, Dr. Anand Chancellor. Um, I'm Terry Kohler in microbiology here. My question is, what are the major concerns about the health effects of your time in space? Yeah, so, you know, one of the biggest things people look at certainly is radiation. Um, since we're in low Earth orbit and we have a very well shielded vehicle and we're still protected by the Earth's atmosphere and magnetic shield, it's radiation here isn't as much of a concern as it would be further out into deep space. But the moment we get up into microgravity, our bones and our muscles were completely unloaded. So unless we actively work to prevent that, and we have countermeasures like exercise, you'd see your muscles atrophy, you'd see in a sense a disuse osteoporosis set in, set in, and it's the same thing that we see in the elderly or people who are bedridden for long periods of time in the hospital, that disuse osteoporosis. We know there are changes in the bony architecture. And so that's, Two of the biggest things. The other thing that we're doing a big experiment on right now, it's called fluid shifts, and that's to look at how this, when, once we get into space, we have this massive fluid shift from the feet up into the head, and could those actually be changes, be causing changes within the internal structure of the eye? I mentioned some swelling in the optic disc, even some changes in the choroid and the retina, um, and so these are things we are studying up here right now. Since you're in microbiology, one thing I will note is that just this week and last week, we are doing surface sampling swabs and doing direct DNA sequencing here on the ISS to actually identify those microbes. And then this next week, we are actually going to be looking for mutations in the DNA itself to see if those bacteria are actually themselves being impacted by the microgravity environment, whether it's just microgravity itself or radiation or another factor. Great. Love it. Thank you. Serena, hi, this is Mike Bungo from Cardiology. Uh, if the ground track is correct, you should be coming up the coast of West Africa now. So take a look out there and make sure there are no hurricanes coming our way. <laughs> but uh, my question is a follow up a little bit to what uh, just preceded us and has to do with countermeasures. So, how much exercise are you doing each day, and how much of it, for example, is on the ARAD or uh, is uh, aerobic? And are you specifically using any pharmacologic countermeasures? Dr. Bungo, it's really good to hear your voice. Um, so, great question. We exercise about two and a half hours a day up here. Every day, it is hard timelined into our schedule. It's about an hour and a half on ARED, which is our advanced resistive exercise device, and that is our weightlifting device. And it's kind of think of it as like a bow flex for station. It's, um, we can do squats, bench press, deadlifts, you name it, but we do that pretty much six to seven days a week. And then we spend another hour every day doing aerobic exercise, whether it's on our treadmill, where we wear a special harness, and that basically provides loading or gravity to pull us down, or we work out on an exercise bike. So we take, it's a good chunk of every day's timeline 
for all six of us up here on board the International Space Station to get all of our exercise in. But we've seen by studies, we've looked at the research, we know that this is imperative. And we know that for even longer missions heading out towards Mars, um, it's gonna be even more important. Now we're lucky, up here on station, station is big. It is the size of a five bedroom house. So we can have a massive weightlifting machine. We can have a big treadmill. How do we, uh, how do we accommodate that on a smaller vehicle? Or, you know, maybe we won't have a bigger habitat until we get to where we're going to. So those are some of the challenges that a lot of our engineers are dealing with right now. Specifically looking at pharmaceuticals, um, there is nothing standard that we use. We take a, a daily multivitamin, but we get most of our nutrition from the food. But we don't take any specific pharmaceutical countermeasures, like a bisphosphonate, for example, to counter the bone loss. Thanks. Hi, Serena. How's it going? Um, my name is Aaron Poliak. I'm a uh, third year medical student. I just want to quickly say uh, you and I both went to GW's undergrads and then we came to this medical school. So I feel a type of bond. <laughs> uh, go, uh, go foggy bottom. So um, question, what type of uh, biomedical research are you participating in? I know you already spoke before about it, but maybe a little more. Yeah, absolutely, and go GW. Um, there are so many biological experiments going on up here right now. Certainly the direct DNA sequencing that I mentioned. Uh, we are also doing RNA sequencing, uh, which is not an easy task, but we think we found a way to do it up here on board the ISS, which really revolutionizes how we perform occupational health up here. Um, other sorts of medical experiments that we're doing. So we've got a special microgravity science glove box that we do a lot of experiments in where we're able to sell culture, media exchange. Um, we've also done some uh, reproductive studies where we've looked at bovine uh, sperm motility as well. But when you look at biotech, you know, so one of the things I always like to bring up is kind of what we call our region ecosystem. What does that mean? Well, every day, anything that any astronaut or cosmonaut urinates out, we turn into water. And that is important because that is something we are going to carry forward from here to live on the moon or live on Mars. You have to be able to have that capability. And so it's every, every day the way we generate oxygen, the way we recycle urine and turn it into water, the way we capture any sort of condensate from the air itself. Anytime I breathe out, that condensate, that humidity is captured and reclaimed by the system and utilized. And you kind of think of how wasteful we are on the Earth. Well, up here, we can't be wasteful with one thing. We are always looking at our water balance, always looking at what we need to put in the system, what we need to take back out. And we've gotten pretty good at it. Thank you very much. Hello, Dr. Chancellor. My name is Jeff McBride, a fourth year medical student. And I'm excited to be a part of the Aerospace Medicine Clerkship at NASA next month. Uh, my questions for you are, what opportunities do you see for civilian physicians to go in space? And how would you advise medical students like myself to prepare for a career in this? Great question. So uh, this, this field is burgeoning, um, especially with commercial space. And you've seen how NASA has already made its commercial crew assignments. We have several vehicles coming down the pike. And all of those vehicles, all of those programs are going to be utilizing physicians or aerospace medicine specialists in a way. And so what I tell folks like yourself is to take advantage certainly of clerkships, and that's exactly what you're doing, which is great, conferences, any sort of um, educational meetings you can get your hands on to learn about aerospace medicine. It's not a widely recognized field. There's only a few institutions in the United States that have this. Luckily, by being in Houston, Texas, you're kind of right in the heartland, certainly with all the research that's going on, uh, Baylor College of Medicine as well. You're, you're just in this lovely area where aerospace medicine means something to people, and you're right next to NASA. So the opportunity to go down there and get experience or just talk with the people who work in operational space medicine or in research research space medicine every day uh, is amazing. So I think, honestly, over the next five to 10 years, um, there's going to be certainly the best way to get into space right now, apply for the astronaut corps. That's what I did. Um, over the next five to 10 years, you're going to be seeing people uh, taking rides just suborbital flight, so not staying for a long period of time in low Earth orbit. Um, and I definitely see physicians on those flights coming up. So get yourself involved with those groups of people, and I'd be happy to talk with you after and let you know how to do that, but you're already on the right track. You're going to love that clerkship. Thank you. 
Thank you, Serena. You were terrific. And we can't wait to have you again when you're back on Earth. Thank you so much. It was really, really great talking with you today. I wish all of you the best of luck. Medical school is the best time of your life, especially at McGovern. Enjoy every moment of it. Enjoy all the friends you make because those will be friends for a lifetime. I'll see you guys later. Station, this is Houston ACR. That concludes the event. Thank you to all participants from McGovern Medical School. Station, we are now resuming operational audio communications.